Warning, this episode contains some strong language. Listener discretion is advised. from the trunk, reading the stories that didn't make it. I'm Hilary B. Bisniex. Listeners, I'm extremely excited to introduce my guests today. They are the author of Finna, which came out last year, as well as numerous short stories, and they are also a professor in an MFA program. Nino Cipri, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I don't know if I... Wow. Nobody has ever called me a professor before, except for like undergraduates that were hoping <laughs> to like impress me um especially right now because i'm i'm not teaching this semester and i just came on last semester as like a, a an adjunct but well, i'll go for it yeah i'm a professor listen <laughs> sure you're a professor you get props for that uh-huh. if you've got students i can teach i have taught you're a professor <laughs> yep they, yeah you're okay. a real actual right, facts fine. adult <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, that might be going too far. But like, you know what? Again, we'll we will accept it. Yep. I will I will take that as the compliment. I'm hoping that it's meant to be. It is absolutely meant to be one. Uh, Nino, you're going to be reading to us from Presque Vu. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and I wanted to to just clarify something. I have a published story that is called Presque Vu. Um, it's in the. It's one of the stories that's in my short story collection uh homesick um this is not that story uh (laughs) this is a this is a trunked story i when i trunked it i stole the title for this other this other story that i wrote um there's very very little overlap in those two stories aside from the title yeah all right okay let me actually just pull up the story all right should i just dive right into it go for it okay The first words out of Sal's mouth to the very first stranger he sees are, tell me where I am. The stranger steps away from him. He's wearing gray slacks and a collared shirt. A black and silver watch is on his wrist. He belongs here and Sal does not. To this man, Sal is a stranger in ragged clothes that reek of sweat and desperation. And so Sal adds, please, please tell me where I am. The man who is not a stranger, every inch of him belongs here, declares his allegiance to the asphalt on which he stands, says to Sal, slowly and with suspicion, You're on 65th and 14th Ave. Ravenna. (laughs) Where is that? Sal demands. Do you have a map? Show me on a map. The man's eyes shift, looking past Sal. He holds up his hands and says, Listen, buddy, I don't want any trouble. Sal can feel the city of long shadows, the slow devourer, a bloated parasite that sits just out of sight, reaching for him. The narcotic sound of its music haunts him. It took so much from him already, and all he has left are his name, the clothes he's wearing, his name, and the knife that he picked up when he was running from the feral ones. He pulls the knife out into his hand now. Its song led him here, and its weight comforts him. Tell me exactly where I am. Words spill from the man's mouth. Northwest of downtown 65th Street, please. Ravenna Park, don't hurt me. I-5's over there. Calvary Cemetery, please. What city? Sal demands. Seattle? The man answers, his voice rising at the end as if unsure of himself. Seattle, Sal says. It sounds familiar. Where is that? Tell me. Washington, the man babbles. The state, not the city. Pacific Northwest. Eastern edge of Puget Sound. West coast, United States. Western hemisphere. Earth. Fuck, man. What do you want from me? Seattle, Washington. (laughs) Sal repeats. And the words become more familiar. United States. Please, don't. Sal shoves him into the alley's brick wall. He rifles through the man's pockets as the man shivers and cries, flinching away from Sal's hands. He takes a money clip from the man's pocket, slips the watch off his wrist, chanting the words the man had said. Seattle, 65th Street, Calvary, Puget, Ravenna. Sal puts the man's belongings into his own pocket and leaves him, repeating the words to himself and adding new ones as the city introduces itself to him. Roosevelt Square, Rising Sun Produce, Pizza Hut, 15th Ave. 
Sal puts a hand to his stomach. It feels as empty as a paper bag crumpling in on itself. Hunger, he thinks. This is hunger. He remembers this feeling. There isn't much food in the city of long shadows, but there isn't much hunger either. Grape vines crawl up the crumbling buildings and walls. Fig, pomegranate, and olive trees erupt from the sidewalk. The roving groups of dancers eat while they sing and stomp their feet, but the food is a garnish to the real nourishment. The dance and music sustains itself. Food is a prelude, or foreplay, or a game. Ooh. Sal's hunger brings with it a memory. A dark-haired man holding out a heaping spoonful of rice, rich with the smell of spices and the sea. He blows on it to cool it, and it looks like steam is fleeing from his breath. The man holds the rice out, hand poised beneath it to catch any falling grains. Sal knows that the man is offering it to him, but the memory ends there. He does not know whether he ate the rice, and if he did, what it tasted like. Sal goes back to the pizza hut. The woman behind the counter stares at him, and he shrinks a little. The light here hurts his eyes. There are pictures and writing on the wall behind the woman, so Sal points at one picture at random. That one, he says. The food, when it comes, weighs him down even more, pinning him here. Ravenna, Seattle, Puget Sound, Washington, Pacific Northwest, United States. He'll have to buy a map. He never wants to be lost again. He's finished half his meal by the time the police come and pick him up. Have you ever taken a wrong turn and then another wrong turn? And when you looked around, realized that you had no idea what street you were on, where the plaza had gone, which directions the sea or the mountains lay in? Did you panic then? Did you hold your destination firmly in your mind and reach for it? Did you inch forward through an odd fog of resistance until you tipped back onto your familiar axis? You must have breathed a sigh of relief. I am here, on this corner, facing southeast, and if I go along this road for a half mile, there will be the theater, the grocery, the bar, my aunt's house. Some never push through that wall. They stay in that liminal place, in a city where it is always close to dusk. They join the others who are also lost, the crowd of mindless dancers wending through half-familiar streets, and fall in with its half-asleep poets that mumble verses beneath their breath, tumble into decaying beds with strangers. They empty their pockets as they walk along, leaving themselves behind. This lost city is littered with the detritus of people's discarded lives. A locket with two faded pictures, a child's drawing of a family standing beneath a blue line of sky, a journal half-filled with scrawling words. The noctambulists, the ones who come and go from the city of long shadows, have many names for it. Perdita, Bardo, Tamasita, Jamevu, or a dozen others. For those who have become entrapped, on the rare occasions that they do discuss where they are, the city is only known as here, wherever this is, wherever we are right now. It turns out his name is Salvatore Agostino Abaroa, and he is 22 years old. There's a missing person report from three years ago, filed by his family in New Jersey. Sal holds his names up to the light like they are jewels, turning them this way and that, marveling at their novelty. His mother, Magdalena, flies out to Seattle to see him and cries when he does not recognize her. When, again and again, she asks him where he has been, he can only tell her, I was lost. She shows him pictures of their mm. family. The man who had fed him rice is not among them, and Sal doesn't ask, feeling protective. The public defender assigned to his case argues for diminished capacity owing to mental illness, as evidenced by Sal's psychogenic amnesia and lingering mental confusion. Sal did not know the year, the current president, his age, or how he got to Seattle. The media throws a spotlight on his case, a man missing for years surfacing thousands of miles away. It comes out that Sal had faced drug charges and solicitation arrests as a juvenile. There's speculation that his missing years featured drug cartels and human trafficking. His public defender, sensing a chance to build her career, hires expert witnesses in psychology and neurology to back up her case. Sal's aging mother flies in from Jersey and testifies about the son that she had given up for dead, how she had lit candles for his soul in church. Sal watches his mother's hands, her fingers twisting around the cross she wears on her neck. Another memory surfaces, her crying, telling him that she doesn't want her only son to go to hell, that God is judging him. He remembers leaving home and not looking back. Sal pleads no contest in exchange for a lighter charge and an easier sentence. Aggravated robbery, three years imprisonment, eligible for parole in 18 months. His first cellmate nicknames him Maps because that is what Sal puts on the walls on his side of the cell. 
Maps from road atlases mm. and torn from the National Geographic sit next to maps he draws himself of the narrow and confined domain of Coyote Ridge Correction Center, the food processing plant where he works. Maps of Jersey City and other places that he is slowly starting to remember. His parents' house, the library of the high school he dropped out of, the abandoned meatpacking plant where he and his friends hung out and got high, the club where he went dancing and sometimes picked up men. Is that who the man with the rice was? Sal has remembered other things about him, that he never toweled off after showering, preferring to let the water evaporate off his skin, that the tips of his fingers were always stained with bright splashes of colored ink. Prison dilates time. Hours stretch and pull, folding extra seconds into each minute. The days drag like blunt nails across his skin. Sal keeps his head down, avoids the gangs that try to pull him into their wars. Sal is tall and taciturn, and there's a coldness in his gaze that suggests something that's not quite madness, but more than mere intensity. One time it's not enough. He offends one of the other men, Darren, by standing too close to him in the day room. Darren kicks Sal in the thigh just above the knee. The pain is immediate, hot and throbbing, and Sal nearly falls to his knees. Instead, he throws himself at the other man and ends up in solitary confinement for two weeks, even though he didn't start the fight. He maps every inch of the featureless room, memorizes the textures of the wall and mattress and floor. He repeats the jail's address to himself, chants it like a prayer. 1301 North Ephrata Avenue, Connell, Washington, United States. He climbs upwards in his mind, higher and higher, until he's floating free of the prison, looking down on all of it from above. He feels the city of long shadows encroaching. No matter how many times he runs his fingers across the familiar edge of the bed frame or repeats the address, he can hear the music that he once danced to, the sounds of flutes and clapping hands, voices raised in an all-consuming joy. Sometimes he can hear the drums of the feral ones, who he was running from when he accidentally escaped the city. He sweats out his terror alone, crouched in the corner of the tiny cell, hands against his ears, He wishes desperately for the knife that had found its way into his hands, the one that had pulled him out and into Seattle. Hmm. When he's released from solitary, Sal gathers what he can and trades for what he can't. A chunk of plexiglass that he sharpens, a handle made from a toothbrush, duct tape to seal them together. The new knife fits perfectly into his palm and his presence calms him. He will always have a way out now. Sal refuses to let himself get lost again. He counts his steps and turns as he is moved from his cell to the mess hall to the rec room. Prison is awful, but he always knows exactly where he is. He's doing time. It's exactly what it sounds like. Nothing but the slow crawl of days, the exact opposite of the terrifying freedom of the city of dusk. It's the noctambulist who approaches him, though Sal has sensed him watching. It's stupid in prison not to notice the people that are noticing you. And there's something about this man, something in his eyes. Not quite madness, but a restlessness, the hint of someone who is from far away and wishes always to go elsewhere. He sits down at Sal's table at dinner, a healthy distance away. Sal grips his plastic fork. The plexi knife glass is in his shoe. I heard you're called Maps, the man says. Some people call me that, says Sal. Cool. The man picks up his spoon and starts poking at his food like he's making sure nothing will crawl out of it. I like Maps. I prefer traveling without them, though. Going off the edges and past the borders and into the Here Be Dragons territory. You know what I mean? Sal chews his food. Slightly stale bread. Pork and beans. Creamed corn. No, not really. Ciudad Perdita, man. You've been there. I know the look. Perdita, Sal repeats. Bardo, says the man. Jamais vu. Limbo. Tomasita. Ringing any bells? I might know it. Sal says. He's never heard these names before, but they sound correct and familiar. Maybe he knew them and just forgot. Why? I'm just making conversation, says the man. He picks up a spoonful of creamed corn and then lets it drip back down onto his plate. I'm just killing time, same as you. I thought the expression was doing time. Ah, says the man, but that implies passivity. Compliance. I'm many things, but compliance is not one of them. Sal swallows a piece of bread. Killing time implies violence. Sure, but it's just a metaphor. So, where's your launch point in this place? My what? The doorway to the labyrinth. The man abandons his tray entirely and leans forward, locking Sal's gaze. How are you getting back? 
You can't honestly prefer prison, man. I'm dying in here. It's the most honest thing the man has said. Sal answers, I thought you were killing time. Yeah, well, it's putting up a hell of a fight. <laughs> Sal tries to put his thoughts in order. <laughs> What's your name? Ben Tudela. What's yours, aside from maps? Sal Abaroa. Three months after finding himself, it's gotten easier to recall his name, but he still stutters over it. Ben notices. Sal is getting the idea that this man notices a lot of things. Shit, he says. You're not a noctambulist. Mm. You're one of the lost ones. You guys never leave. This conversation seems too intense to have in the mess hall. Sal says, I was chased out. Main ads? Ben asks. Ben has names for everything. Sal just knew the feral ones by their shrieks and bellows, their drums, and the blood they shed. They were the nightmare that threaded through the dozing city. The ones that had lost too much of themselves, racing through and tearing apart those that couldn't avoid them. I guess, Sal says. What did you pick up? A knife. When I did, it seemed like it was singing. Hmm. About the person who'd carried it and the place where they came from. It pulled me through and I guess the main ads couldn't follow. You're lucky, Ben says. He whistles. Damn the lucky man. It can take years for a noctambulist to learn to navigate with cast-offs. I can't believe you did it through dumb luck. Dumb luck and desperation. <laughs> Sal leans forward. But what's an octambulist? How much of yourself is put into an object? It depends, of course. A pen you steal from the post office is not the same thing as your grandmother's wedding ring. In the city of Long Shadows, there are three mm -hmm. kinds of people. There are the lost ones like Sal who stumble in and allow themselves to be entrapped. There are the feral ones who were once lost, but who have shed some essential part of themselves and become monsters. And there are the noctambulists. They're not lost. They come and go as they please, using the objects that others have abandoned to navigate into and out of the city. The first noctambulist found, probably by accident, that the objects left to decay in the city's streets <laughs> and gutters held enough of a memory that the person that held it could break through the tenuous membrane that surrounded the city and bring them home. The city of long shadows can be accessed by anyone, anywhere, in the right state of disorientation and vulnerability. It's like a parasitic second skin, a dead-end street, a fence that catches all the trash that blows against it. The lost ones feed it. The main ads, perhaps, are some kind of secondary defense system. And the noctambulists? They've learned to use the city as a shortcut, into and out of anywhere. And nobody loses themselves, Sal asks. Only the ones that don't have much sense of themselves anyway. Some folks are just too permeable for this kind of travel. Dinner is over. Ben and Sal stand up, carrying their trays. Think about what I said, man, Ben says. There's got to be a doorway to the labyrinth somewhere in this place. Somewhere we can get lost. Maybe it's on one of your maps. <laughs> Three months into his sentence and a week after he meets Ben, Sal receives a letter. Dear Sal... I couldn't believe it when I read about you on the news. What the hell, man? Amnesia? For real? Should I be worried that you won't remember me? This is real fucking weird. I thought you were dead. You left. Just slammed out in the middle of a fight, and then you didn't come back. I went crazy trying to find you for a while. You better fucking remember me. I'm putting a picture of us in here. We took it a month after we left Jersey City for Austin. Right after we found that shitty apartment above the bar in Sherrywood. Maybe this will jog your memory. Right back, you bastard. You owe me one hell of an apology. <laughs> the letter is signed, Victor. The photo in the envelope is of Sal and the man in his memory, the one offering him a spoonful of rice. In the photo, they're in each other's space in a way that in prison would be threatening. The way their shoulders touch stirs up a small storm in Sal's chest. Sal feels other memories trying to scratch through, and he gets out the yellow legal pad that he keeps under his pillow. He starts sketching, trying to let his mind drift and become permeable to whatever might bubble up. He draws a line across the paper and then another. Cherrywood, he thinks. An apartment above a bar. The stairs are narrow, hot and dry and dusty, and the apartment is on the third floor, and the noise of the bar thunders up. He flips to a new sheet of paper, draws a boxy three-room apartment. It's always hot up there. In the summer, they drag the mattress out of their room and onto the living room floor, shoving the rest of the furniture apart. They sleep where the air conditioner wheezes out cool, damp air onto their naked bodies. 
They share a mattress, but when it's that hot, they don't touch, except for a gentle brush of a hand along a naked back or an ankle twined around a calf. Mm. Sal writes back, I remember you, parts of you. I'm sorry. He's not sure exactly what he's apologizing for, but Victor is probably right. Sal must owe him at least that much. He asks Ben, what about the people that are left behind when you go into the city? Ben shrugs. What about them? Perdita couldn't suck you in if you didn't want to get lost in the first place. They eat most meals together now. Hmm. He likes this routine he's fallen into. Routines are another kind of map. You thought about our problem? Mm -hmm. Ben asks. Sal thinks of the layout of the prison as he knows it. A loop of honeycombs, cells on the outside, the day room on the inside. I already got lost in there once, he says. How do I know I won't do it again? Victor's letters have jogged memories loose, though some of them have jagged edges. He remembers weeks when the two of them couldn't afford to buy groceries. They'd go downstairs to the bar and share a beer, nursing it for hours while taking turns snatching food off the empty tables. He remembers fights that ended in holes in the wall. But the memory of Victor holding out that spoonful of rice, blowing on it first to cool it, saturates his mind. He wants that. The look on Vic's face, eyebrows raised, inviting. Sal hungers. Listen, Sal, Ben says. You got purpose now. You hold on to that. Hold on to your name and your maps or whatever else you got that's going to pull you through. But then what? Sal asks. When we get through the other side, we're fugitives with nothing. You realize that Perdita is basically a bank vault with no door, right? People mm -hmm. drop wallets, passports, money, jewelry. They're all stuck like you were. Wandering around, dancing their little tunes until they go feral or get eaten by maenads or just drop down and die. Sal nods mm -hmm. and comes to a decision. There's nowhere in this prison that looks at all like a maze. It's impossible. Ben looks down at his tray of food like he's considering throwing it across the hall. So we're fucked then. Sal shakes his head. <laughs> There's still one place where you can lose yourself. In his cell that night, Sal looks at all his maps, all the places he has remembered or memorized. He can go to them. He can be free if he dares. At least he knows this much. Someone is waiting for him. He puts Victor's letter in his pocket the next day, and the photo in his sock, along with the rosary his mother sent him. It reminds him of the time she railed against him, shouting about God and hell and the stain of sin. Ben told him that it's easy to hold on to yourself when you're holding on to something that hurt you. He slips his knife, the sharpened plexiglass blade with a toothbrush handle, into the sleeve of his sweatshirt. At breakfast, Sal eats sparingly, his appetite spoiled by the nervous jangling in his stomach. He eats his toast, drinks a few sips of the too sweet orange juice, and then sets it down. There's no point in waiting any longer. He turns to the man next to him. The other inmates call him Zebra, though Sal's never bothered to find out why. Zebra's not a bad guy, tries to avoid trouble. Sorry about this, Sal says, standing up. What? Zebra asks. Sal pulls out the knife he made and slashes downwards. Zebra throws up his hands, and the plexiglass scores a jagged line across his forearms. A guard tackles Sal before he can land a second strike. When the knife falls from his hand, Sal panics for a moment. But the knife is no good to him anymore. It belongs to the prison and would only ever lead him back here. All the solitary cells are familiar and not familiar. They are all cramped and well lit, with enough room for a bed, a toilet, and a sink. The narrow window is set high, covered in frosted glass, reinforced with wire. The cement block walls have little texture to them. The mattress is thin, and the cold of the stainless steel frame seeps through it. They all look the same, but with nothing to disrupt the monotony of their beige walls, the solitary cells feel alien and strange the longer you stay in them. The walls shift and breathe. You catch things moving out of the corner of your eye. Sal lies on the thin mattress, his body raw and throbbing where the guard threw him to the ground and kicked him. It hurts to breathe, and he feels dizzy. He tries to sit up grunting with the pain, but gives up. He wonders how long he's been in here. It could have been an hour, or two, or twenty. Maybe all the shit about Perdita, about the city, was some kind of shared delusion. Ben pulled him into his own brand of personal craziness, or he pulled Ben into his. The weight is torture. This was all for nothing, he thinks. He will be left here, alone, trapped in by walls that shrink with every breath. The act of crying is agony, tears burning down his swollen eyes and bruised and scratched cheeks, but he can't stop. 
He's failed, he thinks. He's stuck here, and they'll keep him in solitary, deny him parole, maybe even extend his sentence. He's cried himself into a thin, restless doze when he hears the flutes. He doesn't open his eyes, but he reaches out, listening. The sound of a drum joins the flute, and there is a smell of something different in the cell, something besides disinfectant and Sal's rank sweat, a wild smell of dirt and grapes and crumbling stone. Sal forces himself to keep his eyes shut, maintain his half-awake stupor, even as he sits up, pushes to his feet. He takes one step, and then another, each as cautious and enormous as the first steps he took out of his mother's arms, as the jogging strides he took to meet Vic when they left for Austin. Mm. Another step, and then another. He doesn't dare open his eyes. When he hears the flute, at first it feels like someone is pouring cool water onto his fevered skin. He drinks it in, lets it fill him, lets it soothe the agony of his cracked ribs and swollen, battered face. The sheer relief loosens his grip. Why was he holding so tightly onto himself? It would be so easy to let go, to shed all these tiny weights that add up to such a great burden. The rosary beads that his mother gave him nearly slip through his fingers until he remembers and he catches hold of them, pressing them tightly against his palm. Oof. Sal opens his eyes and sees the deep gold of evening light on gray stone walls crumbling under the weight of wild grape vines. He hears music. He hears voices raised in ecstatic cries. He almost collapses in relief at being free from his cell. Another part of him is panicking. He has to get out of here as quickly as he can before the city works its magic on him again. Sal pulls out the photograph of him and Vic, sitting together, shoulders touching, bent towards each other. For a second, he feels nothing. Then he feels, from somewhere deep inside himself, past his throat and lungs and gut, a pull. Straight ahead, it says. Then right then left. Walk downhill until the road forks. Take the left path, and then keep following it until you are home. That's it. Ooh. Whoa. Jesus, Nino. That okay. was incredible. I had such a moment of paranoia. Like, thank you. <laughs> I had such a moment of paranoia that I had forgotten <laughs> to actually hit record, but no, we're good. I don't have to read that whole thing over again. Thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> Oh, that was awesome. So, like... You are the only person who I think has heard or read or seen or anything the story since, like, 2014. I'm pretty sure I, like, (laughs) wrote it, edited it a little bit, and then just, like, put it it away in my Google Docs and have never really looked at it since. Uh, That is... I mean... I wish I could have written a story like that in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it. I edited it before this, just mostly for length. It was about, it was, like, originally about 5,700 words, and I edited it down to, like, I think I got rid of, like, four pages of it just to make sure that it would be about under 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, but it's, like, that's... That, that's something I wrote in 2014. I'm still very proud of that story. And I'm looking at it now and I'm like, why can't I write short fiction anymore? What happened? (laughs) Like (laughs) I used to know how to do this. Yeah. That just like the, I I was blown away from like the first sentence because you're like describing a person. And I was like, I can't, I, I never describe people in my writing. (laughs) Okay, I mean, like, I don't think it's something that is, like, necessary to do in every story. Like, some genres, like, you know that there, it's sort of, like, an expectation that you'll get, like, a full... Like, I've been reading a lot of romance for the last, like, two months or so. Um, mm-hmm. And, like, it's sort of an expectation that you will get at least, like, one paragraph or, like, a solid idea of, like, what each of the characters look like. In science fiction, it's not as important. Like, it's not necessarily an expectation that every single person, like, picking up a science fiction or fantasy book is going to have. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so, with, and with this story, it felt important. Like, it, it felt like, um, because Sal is kind of coming out of this, this, this city that's sort of, like, fed on his memory and his identity, that, like, he doesn't have as much interiority at first, but he's really outwardly focused. Mm -hmm. Um, Or something like that. Like I said, I wrote this in 2014, (laughs) and I... (laughs) All of my memories of it at this point are are suspect. 
Right, yeah. So uh, before we started recording, you mentioned that uh, this was something that you wrote during Clarion, is that correct? Yeah, so I attended the Clarion Writing Workshop in San Diego in 2014, um, and this was one of the stories that I wrote. I don't remember which week it was exactly. Um, but it was one that I was like really excited about. I think I had kind of been playing around with this this concept of like, you know, a city or a place that you can only get to when you're lost. Uh, mm-hmm. But for a little while, and I'd been trying to write this story and I had a good idea of like who Sal was. Um, so I had these two elements and I just really wanted to write something and like so yeah this was what I came up with uh and I workshopped it it was a really interesting experience actually and by interesting I mean mm, fraught um (laughs) (laughs) so I workshopped it as far as I remember like most of my classmates gave me like really positive feedback they responded to uh you know all of the things that I had hoped that they would respond to Mm -hmm. and they all went and the way that clarion goes is like the workshop is run like every person has an opportunity to speak while Mm -hmm. the author you know just kind of sits there takes in their feedback and doesn't really respond until the very end um right that particular week the teacher the way that she had run it was like okay you all have like you know two to three minutes to talk so we don't have to stay here for like 80 hours um but Uh i'm going to give myself more time to talk And so after all of my classmates went around, you know, this teacher just kind of like uh, sat up a little bit and like tore it to shreds. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Which is, I mean, if you've ever been through a workshop, I think most writers have that experience at least once in their lives where, Mm -hmm. you know, they write something and everybody just is like or not everybody, but like one person at least is like the person to say like, here are all the things that I find wrong with your story. Um, And you know, usually it will be accompanied by like, here are the ways that I think you can fix it. Mm -hmm. But for some, like for one hopes, one hopes. I don't remember if the teacher said anything about that. I'm sure they did. Um, But like, sometimes like you just kind of get stuck on like, this story is broken and all of the different things that people have told me to fix about it are it's too much it's too much work like i already sank too much energy into this it feels like a lost cause and that's kind of what happened with this story in particular um Mm -hmm. i also wanted to expand the story into like a novel or a novella and at the time i still had no idea how to do that and i fumbled (laughs) through that like for months afterwards and then eventually i just i just said, okay, well, you know, I I tried. I like this character. I like, you know, this concept. And I like the title. So I'm just going to steal all of those things and, like, you know, transform them into other stories. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's a very familiar feeling to me that I feel like some of my... Some of my favorite stories are ones that I had something that I couldn't let go of from a previous story and was just like, okay, well, I'm going to take this, this, and this out of that other story that didn't work and and put it into this new thing and hopefully make it work better. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I I think when I'm talking to, because now I'm a teacher and I have my own students, like, I think I end up usually calling it the compost pile. Like, if it doesn't work in Mm -hmm. this format, keep it, you know, don't, don't say like, well, I tried and it didn't work. And therefore I'm just going to run away into the woods and never come back and never write another word in my life. Or like, you know, something mm-hmm. less dramatic than that. But, yeah. you know, keep it around because you like this just might not have been the right story for that concept or that character or that world. Like there's nothing to say that you can't revisit it. Mm-hmm. In the, and that's, in like, um, that's very much, you know, I I think that anybody who has heard any amount of writing advice and certainly anybody who's like taken any sort of writing class will have heard, you know, kill your darlings. And that, that doesn't mean like, you know, murder them out of the one and only draft you have and let those words never exist again. It's, you know, put like copy and paste that out of the draft or create a second draft or whatever. But like, 
hold on to those things because you still like they mean something to you for a reason yeah um and obviously like i mean like i said in the beginning of this like i i've recycled all of these concepts at this point i took the title it's mm-hmm. a it's it's a totally different story i think like the main character in that has some overlap with uh with sal um in that he's just a, a very depressed man um <laughs> dealing with some some very weird shit um right and get and gay like you know <laughs> like everybody yeah. the, the things that i write um but like you know this concept of a space that you can only navigate to either because like you're already disoriented or lost or willing to get lost is a concept that I kind of forms the backbone of Finna. Also like the idea that, Mm -hmm. you know, you can navigate to and through this space by like finding objects of other people is, is another concept that um, just got reworked into, into Finna as like, you know, uh, a weird Swedish, like, yeah. piece of retro tech that you know helps you navigate through wormholes that open up in your workplace yeah well i, w- I was gonna say like this feels very much like finna in a lot of ways and that absolutely makes sense um mm-hmm. for for people who have not had a chance to read finna yet can you give us uh the elevator pitch for this book finna follows Two co-workers um, at a giant uh, big box retail store that is absolutely 100% not Ikea. It's definitely not Ikea. Mm-hmm. Um, who are given the unfortunate task of tracking down a customer that has disappeared into a wormhole that has appeared in their store. Which, you know, happens. You know, like if you've ever been into an Ikea or a place that's not Ikea, uh, sometimes mm-hmm. wormholes just appear there. Um, the other kind of complication to this right. is that <laughs> these two co-workers have just broken up three <laughs> days before. Uh, so it's, it's a story that is, you know, uh, examines like queer heartbreak and the absolute garbage ass job of working like low wage retail work, uh, <laughs> and having to like, mm-hmm. you know, risk your life and life and your limbs and you know your sanity all because all to save like somebody else's bottom line basically right yeah so basically capitalism basically capitalism uh i i was definitely channeling a lot of like rage feels <laughs> at capitalism yeah. while writing this it's it's uh listeners it's just a very good timely book it's uh a novella so it is very short you can read it in one sitting uh you probably will read it in one sitting just go and get it from your local indie or from your library it's good thank you um also if you're in the mood for a story that is kind of about escaping this is very much it's very much a story about escaping like Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah the uh I feel like Finna came out at like just the right time because we were all in lockdown and just really wanted to get out. <laughs> and we still do. <laughs> a year almost do. later. Here are like yeah. March 415th or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, listeners, we are recording this at the tail end of February, though this doesn't come out for another two months. Uh, mm-hmm. So... We will probably still be in lockdown when this actually comes out. But I will say, if this is coming out in two months, then that means that Finna's sequel is probably out now, or will be out very soon, hopefully. Yes. uh, Mm -hmm. Listeners, at the time you are hearing this, if you're hearing this on launch day, Defect comes out on Tuesday. Go buy it. And it's going to be out on 420, which I do feel like is like especially good for yeah that's just like fucking nice yeah thank you like just if you if you if you partake partake in (laughs) this book it's gonna be fun even if you don't partake read this book yeah you don't have to be yeah (laughs) you don't have to be stoned to read it obviously but it might make it funnier (laughs) 
Yeah, I, or I was, scarier actually. Now that I think sca- about it, I mean, you know, depending on how it hits you. Defect is just like in general darker than Finna too. Like, uh, mm-hmm. it's definitely a little bit more violent. Like, there's some like funny levity moments, but I, I definitely leaned into um, some body horror elements and like some of the more kind of like exploitative uh like labor exploitation and like interpersonal mm-hmm. exploitation that Finna kind of like dances around a little bit and then Defect just kind of goes all in on This yeah. was the book that I wrote like in 2020 as well so like right it's, yeah all that's in there too Yeah yeah, I'm I'm super excited for this book to come out. Uh, it's just going to be fantastic. Uh, so I wanted to jump back a little bit because you are a teacher as well as I a am writer, a and mm-hmm. uh, talk a little bit about like how teaching undergrads like interfaces with your own writing and how like you get to interface with them. Well, it's I don't just teach undergrads. Like I've taught under like I was teaching undergrads um at the University of Kansas. Right now I'm teaching um graduate students in an MFA program. I've also taught uh just like That's adult right. classes at, you know, different kinds of cons, uh or mm-hmm. just through I think I did one through Clarion West actually. Um so I feel like a lot of my teaching styles influenced by by the fact that I was in I've been in so many workshops I went through Clarion I went through an MFA um and like I've already kind of talked about some of the the bad experiences that I've had so Mm -hmm. my teaching style now is really influenced by like trying to get away from from that um and also kind of engaging with students and figuring out like what are the things that you were trying to do in this story um Mm -hmm. what are the things that you're really excited about what are what is like, what is actually going to sustain you while writing or revising or like, poly- like you know, all of this through all of the steps of the writing process, mm-hmm. um, which I feel like gets lost in some of the workshops that I've been in, um, mm-hmm. where it, it just kind of yeah, it it was definitely not something that was ever really covered. Um, I have a bachelor's in creative writing. And Mm -hmm. we never talked about that in, I think, any of my classes, except maybe the one that was taught by an adjunct professor who was a working writer. Yeah. Um, And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think, like, I had a really great experience in my MFA, for the most part. Like, I think any full-time graduate program is, like inevitably kind of like a war of attrition like you just kind of have Mm -hmm. to survive it (laughs) yeah um and oh wait where was i going with that uh shit uh you yeah oh working (laughs) writers (laughs) but like yes i've i've heard from a lot of other writers that like you know especially in these like quote-unquote like studio mfas that so much emphasis is put on like oh well this is like you know a place of like pure artistic integrity which is garbage mm-hmm. <laughs> like, there's like i mean i don't think that there's a single way to be a writer um and i don't mm-hmm. think that like trying to divorce writing from you know this dreadful concept of like having to work for a living is doing anybody yeah. any favors um but it's something that like at least in like academia almost never gets covered. I think it gets talked about a lot in like professional spaces, you know, uh, SIFWA mm-hmm. and the NebulaCon or NebulaCon does like a really amazing job with that. Um, a lot of other cons have professionalization tracks. Um, I kind of yeah. vaguely remember AWP, which is like the big literary writing conference, like kind of doing that, but mm-hmm. to like a lesser extent. But I think also like AWP is still very, um, kind of like wrapped up in a lot of like academic writing programs. It's the American Association of Writing Programs, so that makes sense. Right. But like, I do think that it like 
I do what like I really really wish that writing programs were a little bit more balanced in that approach that like mm -hmm. you know they were talking to the, they were talking to their students about like here's how to make writing a sustainable practice like not it's not, and that's not going to look the same for everybody uh right. I don't think everybody even if it was possible would be cut out to write full time without having like a you know other gigs or a full-time job or a part-time job mm -hmm. um like so how do you build the like you know how do you kind of like help students envision the kind of a writing career that they do want like uh within the unfortunate kind of like parameters and paradigm that we're all stuck in right now which is like it's very hard to make a living in the arts it's only gotten harder yeah. this last year <laughs> yeah 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 i i remember from my program like getting sort of half of it where you know my one professor who was a working writer would tell us like you know if you get paper rejections stick them to your wall if you get uh if you get electronic rejections print them out and stick them to your wall and like wallpaper your your writing room with rejections to like keep yourself going but even then it was never like a conversation of like you're gonna trunk stories or like mm, you know sometimes okay. you're gonna write a thing and it just doesn't work yeah at first i was just like i can't believe that somebody was actually saying like giving people advice of like just surround yourself with your marks of like things that feel like failure <laughs> that just sounds yeah. like the most depressing shit i gotta say <laughs> yeah um but that's a really good point. Like, I also think, too, that, like, there's not, like, a lot of workshops don't make room for talking about failure or, like, things that feel like failure. And I think the idea that, like, you trunk a story can feel like that to some people. And rejections can feel like, oh, I, like, mm -hmm. it, for some people, it is, like, almost indistinguishable, the idea of being rejected from actually failing at something. Um, and, yeah, I wish... I wish like writing programs like in academia did that. I, I will say that I think Clarion, um, my experience is that Clarion like actually did so much more to like uh, help me and like help all of my classmates like kind of understand what what it's like to be a working writer. Like what are some mm -hmm. of the different ways that looks like. Um, and that's good and bad too. Like that included like... Nora Jemison breaking down uh, her like yearly writing income for the last couple of years and just, like being like, yeah, this year I got a really big advance and it was great, like big advance for a three book deal. Uh, this past year I made $20,000 and, you know, 15% yep. of that had to go to my agent and a third of it had to go to taxes. Like, right. Which I know was like kind of depressing for some people to hear, but also it was like, like nobody had said anything like that to me. I had no idea what being what being like a writer as a career even looked like. Mm -hmm. um, nobody had ever said any. Nobody had ever mentioned that there was something called a schedule C to me before. Like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I feel like you know I'm I'm thinking back to I guess sort of the earlier days of like what online discourse about writing looked like but you know like in 2011 2012 like there were basically two people i can think of who were talking about writing income online and that was mm. john scalzi at one end and jim c hines at the other end and like yeah you know scalzi was like you know hey i like this is how much money i made and i'm insanely privileged and lucky and mm -hmm. then Jim was like, okay, here's a breakdown of everything. And, you know, this is how many books I'm selling. I'm not John Scalzi. But, mm -hmm. like, even then, it's, like, very a, a very limited amount of data that you're getting from people. Yeah. Uh, and even that's still, like, wild to, to students just because they never, like, it doesn't get talked about. And I think part of that is just because Americans, like, there's this idea that you're not supposed to talk about money, just in mm -hmm. general. It's just, you know, it's gauche or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
And like, you know, you actually can face like real consequences at your job if you dare to compare your salary with somebody else's. Um, mm-hmm. oh, God, I <laughs> this was in 2010. Yeah, 2010. I was actually working as a house cleaner. I was it was like a, a, a maid for like residential yeah, residential mm-hmm. houses. Um, and I was working for this very, very small company. There was just three people, um, one of which was me. And it was run actually by a family friend, which makes this even more fucked up. Oh, uh, no. But I found out that the other worker was making $2 more an hour than I was. Uh. For the like, literally the exact same work. Like we worked the same hours. We worked the same houses. We worked the same exact jobs. And I confronted the boss, my boss, like my family friend about this. And, you know, she agreed to give me a $1 raise, not to make us equal, but I got a $1 raise out of it. And then she, like, like, tried to, like, shame me about talking to this other guy about what we were each making. And this other guy was my sister's fucking boyfriend. Like, like, what do you mean? Why did you think, like, you you thought we weren't going to talk about this? We lived, like, we literally shared a house. Like, (laughs) so... Yeah, oh, it's have, so messy. <laughs> I have so many feelings about working um, and how shitty it has been for so long. But yeah, yeah. Um, God, where, well, like, what were we even talking about before I went on that little mini rant? I, I have no idea. Doesn't matter. Writing, yeah. writing, writing is right. good. We're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> writing is good we're good at it sometimes we don't get paid for it sometimes we do get paid for it and sometimes we're getting paid either much more or much less than other people and i think that i'm really really happy that that conversation has expanded so much in the last like even the last mm-hmm. few years um i know online although i don't remember the woman who yeah, started the, the hashtag but yeah, just talking about like what advances did you get and who are the people who are getting big advances and who are the people who are getting no advances at all or very, very small ones. Um, yeah. And like, aside from illuminating the fact that uh, like authors who were people of color, uh, who were trans, like were making significantly smaller advances, like it illuminates like so much more just like in conversation about like what that kind of money actually looks like. Um, and like Mm -hmm. who gets it and why they get it too. Yeah. Yeah. For real. And it's, yeah, it's just like the more, I mean, this goes for all labor, the more transparency there is among the workers, the better everyone can get treated hmm Yeah. Like, it it gets weird and complicated and, like, layered as well. Like, just because, I mean, publishing is, it's, 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 a, it's a, it's an industry that is based in the arts and it still kind of, like, has this sort of shiny quality to it that, like, this sort of idealism mm-hmm. to it, you know, that, like we're just lucky to be here. And it's like, it's not luck. I worked my ass off to get here. Uh, and I know that right. the other people around me who are not getting the same opportunities that I am, like, worked just as hard, if not harder. I mean, maybe not all of them, mm-hmm. but like, you know, it's 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 not a level playing field. It never has been. And like, the, the lie that it is does a, a disservice to all of us, really. Yeah, well, no, it doesn't sure. do a disservice to all of us. It just does a, no. a very large service for the people that are in charge and, like, are benefiting from it. Right. Yeah. It does a, a big service to the dominant society. Yes. I'm so I'm so glad to uh, get to have a conversation about, like, labor and inequity on a podcast about writing. <laughs> because, I mean, like... Yeah. Deeply Where sad. else is it going to happen? Uh, I mean, it feels like because I'm like, you know, I came out with Finna, like, that is like one of the main things that I always talk about is just like, mm-hmm. oh, you want to talk about capitalism? No? Too bad. Like, <laughs> it's one of the things I care about. I did not spend yeah. like five years, you know, in labor organizing to just not talk about how unfair everything yeah. is. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
So at at this point, this like weird police box blue thing just showed up in my room, and I was wondering, you know, maybe we can take a take a step into this time machine and go back and talk to younger Nino about some of the things that you wish you'd known then that you know now about oh my gosh, writing and Nino. like all that. <sighs> well, I think first I'm going to tell younger Nino that they, um, it's okay to, to spend money on a haircut <laughs> 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 because I had so many unfortunate ones from age like 20 to like, 30 (laughs) oh no it's fine it's fine it's fine um so yeah it's okay to get a haircut it's okay to pay money for that haircut um but also it's okay to like have your friends cut your hair uh but for for little baby writer nino i i think i would like to say that um the advice that i would give them is to figure out the things that they love about writing and to always keep it central in their mind like mm-hmm. at every step of the way like when you're first drafting it's okay to just let yourself be indulgent when you're revising it's okay to think like you know what is it that i loved so much about the story that it made me sit down you know in front of my laptop for however many days however mm-hmm. many months it took to to finish it or to co- keep coming back to it while revising it um And, like, the things that you love about your story and that, like, really, really interested you, your readers and editors will be able to, they'll pick that up, I Mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Like, and I think, too, like, when you're writing about things that you love and things that you care about the most, it's, like, I've always, like, I've noticed how much people respond to the stories that I've written that were, like, I... I wrote them when I was feeling really vulnerable, you know, and like Mm -hmm. publishing them made me feel vulnerable. And like, it's sort of a way of like opening up conversation. Um, And I can't Mm -hmm. do that all the time. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to actually like pull my guts out for strangers with every single story that I write. Um, But when I can, and when I do, those are often the stories that people respond to the most. So Mm -hmm. that's what, that's what I would say. Like, keep, keep those things that are the closest to your heart, like in the center of your mind while while you're writing and editing and revising and polishing and, you know, (laughs) sending it it out into the void over and over again. Yeah. 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 That's, um, that all really resonates with me. And that's, uh, awesome to like hear somebody who like, you know, I, I sit here as the podcaster with some sort of, like, mantle of authority given to me, but I'm always, like, all my guests, I'm like, (laughs) you're the one who knows things, like. I know, like, two things, (laughs) maybe. (laughs) (laughs) And it took me a long time to learn both of them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Nina, this has been just an absolutely incredible ride so i'm so grateful for you to come on the show thank you so much for having me this was really fun to like first off just like revisit this revisit this story that i hadn't seen in however many years and then also to like just have like a really fun and rewarding conversation and also to talk trash on former bosses of mine that yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good stuff um listeners nino's defect comes out on 420 you should buy 69 copies of it that would be very nice of you so nice so nice (laughs) uh before we get going nino where can our listeners find you elsewhere Uh, i am mostly on twitter which is not always the best place to be but i can be (laughs) usually found there uh at nino cipri that's n-i-n-o-c-i-p-r-i uh I'm also, like, attempting to occasionally be on Instagram. I'm scared of Instagram, though. I'm not sure why. And I post pictures almost of, like, of, like, almost nothing but my cat there. So if you really want to, like, see my cat more, then you can definitely follow me on Instagram. I'm at wingnuttery. There's another Nino Cipri on Instagram. I got real (laughs) mad when I realized that. Um, Oh, the other thing that 
I should also mention is I have a newsletter that comes out twice a month-ish. Um, I occasionally go on hiatus like I did for most of 2020. Um, yep. <laughs> but there's a link to it on my website, which is just ninosipri.com. It's called Cool Story Bro. I talk about stories that I love and I talk about the act of storytelling and why it's why it's cool, bro. Fantastic. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Well, Nino, thank you once again so, so much for coming on the show. It's been a delight. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to thank having you, so you back on me. at some point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got I do have another book coming out in 2022. That's another... Actually, <laughs> it's another, like, retelling of a story that is in... That I wrote a short story of that I turned into a novel. But that one actually this one actually worked, unlike unlike Prescott. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, right. we will uh we will have you back on then. I can pretty much guarantee it. That's awesome. I look forward to it. All right. Listeners, stick around for next month when our guest will be RJ Theodore. Tales from the Trunk is mixed and produced in beautiful Oakland, California. Our theme music is Paper Wings by Ryan Boyd. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash trunkcast. All patrons of the show now get a sticker and logo button, along with show outtakes and other content that can't be found anywhere else. You can find the show on Twitter at trunkcast, and I tweet at hbbisnyx. If you like the show, Consider taking a moment to rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. And remember, don't self-reject. <laughs>